here. We are in week five of the series that we've been calling Family Matters because as we have been just repeating, family is the most important institution that we believe God himself ordained and has created and never has there been a more important time for families to be following Jesus, for families to be reflecting his kingdom values. Um, I want to encourage you, if you were with us last week at all, or if you happen to miss, last week we actually jumped into the topic of, you know, we've been talking about family, husbands, wives, all these different things. We're going to spend the next couple weeks speaking about how we um, communicate to our kids, uh, how we pass on our faith, most importantly to our kids. We're even going to talk a little bit of how we discipline our kids. Somebody say amen to that, right? Um, and if, I just want to encourage you, if you missed last Sunday, we actually spoke a little bit about also, when family looks a little bit different, and we have seasons of singleness in our life, right? Each of us face moments where we're going to have seasons of being a- a- alone in a physical sense, right? Whether we are widowed, whether somebody passes away, whether you're young and in your 20s waiting for that special someone. And so last week, the message was called Serving the Lord While Single. So I want to encourage you, if you, if you missed that, jump in. I know everybody's on vacation in the summer and different things are happening But you have a Bible, and this is what I would say the most important thing we can begin with as we talk about kids today, as we talk about raising this generation, not the next generation, raising the now generation, these kids right now. There's a very frightening verse in Judges chapter 2, I believe it's verse 10. And I kind of look at this in a little bit of context. This takes place right after the leader Joshua died. And he talks about, This verse talks about a generation that didn't know of the things of God. And I just want to take a moment and think about what an amazing leader Joshua was. And if this was a challenge for Joshua's generation under his time and under his leadership, then I think we should be on high alert that this will be a very difficult task for us as well. We're going to get into some scripture. If you would just go to the book of Uh, judges and then hold and get ready we're going to jump over to the book of psalms quite a bit psalm quite a bit today but hey are you ready to get into god's word can we read a verse all right let's read this together it says this in judges 2 10 after that generation died another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the lord or remember the mighty things he had done Judges 1 opens up with some similar language as well, but this verse suggests to me, like I said, that this is one of, if not the most important thing that we can do as parents, as people, as grandparents. doesn't matter really what our title is, right? But the most important thing we can do is pass something on to the generation behind us. A little context here. This verse was written um, at a time, right? This verse in Judges was written at a time when uh, the nation of Israel... We could say the nation, the parents, the teachers of the law, the priests. Really, this is a, a nationwide team effort that they, basically what we can hear is they did not do a good job of God matter. They didn't do a good job of passing on the things that they really believed in. They didn't do a good job of passing on the bedrock that was their faith. And what happens in the book of Judges, as a consequence, the nation suffers because of their relationship vertically with the Lord. They suffer on earth, right, horizontally because of the relationship that is lacking vertically with God. And the consequence is they face a time and a season of judgment. How many of you know and would you agree, man, it is true and it is important and we've got to be careful and we've got to be intentional to pass on our faith to younger people around us, right? Sometimes we're not, it doesn't always have to be the, the under 15 crowd. I would say, man, if there's someone in your life that is younger and they view you in respect as an elder, one of the most important things, I believe in some ways our, fa- our nation constantly faces the consequences of turning our hearts from the Lord. Sometimes, right? Because as Christians, we believe that everything that happens, God either allows to have happen, he lets it pass through his hands, right? Or he causes it to happen. But he either allows it or he causes it. And so sometimes, man, I think if we aren't intentional, turn to someone and say intentional, right? Intentional means we got to put that phone down. It means we got to take that tablet away from our kids, right? Right? If we leave our kids in this, in this godless type environment, I feel like in some ways, 
I was just really, I think I texted my dad something on the lines. I was just, you know when you're just a little fired up? I was a little fired up. I was a little sad. I was, you know, you go from being like sad to mad, sad to mad. But I, t- I texted my dad something like this. I said, our nation, we have a soulless nation, right? Our nation, when we, when we promote the things that we promote, like, gosh, the identity or changing the identity or changing the sex of young people, things like puberty blockers, like there's things that are just evil that our nation is allowing, not only allowing, encouraging, encouraging towards this generation, right? And it's almost as if, man, if we can just keep this generation from reproducing, (laughs) if we can just keep this generation from getting people into the future, evil wins the future. And sadly, there's a little bit of that going on even in our mindsets. I think it's, it's one of the saddest things I've seen is that statistics back this up is that young people today are waiting longer and longer than ever before to have kids if they're deciding to even have children at all in their lifetime right and so one of the most important things we can do is pass on our faith because young people matter and i'll say it like this children matter our kids matter psalm one and and we see like jesus was pretty heavy on this in scripture. If you have your Bible, Psalm 127, verse 3. The Bible says this, children are a gift. Maybe sometimes moms or dads, maybe, maybe in the moment, in the heat of the moment, you don't feel, you feel like that gift is talking back a little much, right? Or whatever it is. But Psalms 127, 3, children are a gift from the Lord. And I love this. It says they are a reward from him. That is such a fabulous, that's, a, that's an amazing way to describe my three daughters. If I apply that, like think of that in your life, think of your grandkids. Insert their names into that passage for a moment. Because I would go like, man, Peyton, Harper, and Quinn, they are a gift from the Lord. And then I love this part, they are a reward from Him. And I think it's so, now that I'm a dad and been one for 12 years, I think, man, one of the saddest things is that there are people who have chosen to miss out on this gift this reward that is our kids. And in fact, Jesus valued children so much, let's look at a few things that he had to say about how we reach children, how we spend time with them, how we allow them to approach us, how we allow children to, can I say it like this, interrupt our lives. Because that's really what it is, right? When people don't want to have kids in some regards, sometimes, maybe not all the time, but sometimes it's just a blatant statement that I don't want my life to be interrupted. I want my vacation time, and I want my dinners, and I want my whatever it is. It's like I don't, I don't want to be bothered by a child. And sadly, culturally, this has permeated throughout our society where we actually have young people in their 20s through 40s that are saying, you know what, children are just kind of a bother. Right? Children are just kind of in the way. But Jesus had very strong words. Matthew chapter 18. You have a Bible, would you open it? Matthew chapter 18, verse 10 says this. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus, Matthew chapter 19, verse 14. So Jesus could lay his hands on them and pray for them. But get this, it says the disciples scolded the parents for bothering Jesus. The disciples are always the guys that have a lot to learn in Scripture. That's why I like them, right? I can relate to them. But one of the things I love, like, I love that we were able, we're, we're a ministry because of our school and our church, and just what we've been blessed with, what has been left behind for us to operate and do ministry with, like, I love the fact that we can take 70 ki- people to camp and support a bunch of kids. And some people will be like, well, kids, kids at camp are just kids. And I remember, like, years ago, I felt like, like the high school teams and the junior high camps always got, like, the good worship. I know, like, they, like, people would just kind of be like, here's a guitar for a kid's camp, and that's all they get, because they're just little kids. But I don't know about you guys, like, how many of you literally made a decision to follow Jesus when you were 12 or below? How many of you, like, I felt like, honestly, I remember being at that very camp and, and receiving the gift of tongues, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think I was in fourth grade, right? I remember being at that camp feeling that scary, freaky call to ministry that I didn't want to, like, follow in my dad's footsteps and do right? And so all this to say, children are the utmost important thing we can do and spend our time and invest in. I love that. Be careful. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. 
Matthew 19, starting in verse 13. One day some parents brought their children to Jesus so he could lay hands on them and pray for them, but the disciples scolded the parents for bothering him. And look what his response is in verse 14 now. But Jesus said, Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. And he placed his hands on their heads and he blessed them before he left. I had some wonderful moments this week praying for some of our kids and some of them crying at camp and just describing. And I remember last year, one of my daughters was crying at camp and I said, are you, I wanted to just kind of debrief and talk about why are we, you know, we're getting away from all of these distractions. We're going up the mountain to hear from God. So what is it you're, you're feeling, sweetheart? What are you crying about? And I remember she made this statement. She said, I don't know. I'm happy, but I just feel like God is so real. Right? And isn't that like sometimes we just become overwhelmed with that emotion, that reality that sometimes in life we face where nobody can, can tell you about God, you have to just experience Him. And she said, God just feels so real right now. Right? And when you get that feeling, you think of how amazing our God is. We spoke at camp about the God of the universe, and we had some pictures of the Milky Way galaxy, and it's always mind-boggling to me to see just how tiny and almost it feels insignificant not only Earth is, but like our entire like universe, right? That we're revolving around this thing, this combustible thing called the, the sun, which is a star. And thinking about like how mighty and how amazing, I can't even wrap my mind around how amazing our God is right? It's probably why, like, when we always, we always say, like, sometimes, like, has anybody ever made this comment? And I have done this because when things happen that I either disagree with or don't understand, I always say, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have some questions for the big guy, <laughs> right? We've all, right, or some form of that. When I get to heaven, I'm going to have some questions for God. But in reality, you know what's going to happen when we get to heaven? We are going to fall flat on our face awestruck in total like we we will we won't even know what to do right we will fall down on our face in worship because he is so so amazing jesus pulled a child and other scriptures onto his lap and and can we say it like this children they were loved there's there's no i'm not saying like children were an after like there was no like nothing wrong going on but in that culture children I don't know if we want to say they were thought as a nuisance, but they, were, they just always seem to be on the sidelines in Scripture, don't they? Kind of like in that culture, children seem to be on the periphery a little bit. Not to say they weren't highly valued, but they really weren't consequential, right, Off, uh, to, to people's mindsets. But Jesus, he begins to say something different to his disciples when he says this, all children matter. Number one, would you write that down in your notes? Jesus says, all of these kids matter let them come to me in fact if you want to actually get to me if you actually want to spend time with me in heaven your heart needs to become like that of a child he went on in another section of scripture he said if any of you think you can stop a child from coming to me or or getting in the way of their spiritual growth and then he even says it kind of if any of you mess with or have you hurt a child he says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 5 through 6, he says, if you get in the way or you mess with or if you hurt a child, there's a scripture that many of us know. Would we read this together? Verse 5, Matthew chapter 18. Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, look at this, he says, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. See, church, Jesus declares over and over that our kids matter a whole lot. A whole lot. In fact, even like when we talk about the issue of having kids, it's almost one of the first biblical commandments. It's not even a suggestion when the Bible says, be fruitful and what? Multiply, right? He says, have kids. But sadly, it's become... It's become more and more normal to say, you know what, I just don't have time for them. They are just too inconvenient. And I got news for you. Any, any parents that are going to be a parent soon or you want to have a kid soon, here's the reality. Sometimes kids are inconvenient. Sometimes they're a little stinky. 
Sometimes they blow out that diaper. I'm so thankful I'm way, like, what are 12, 9, 12, 10, and 7 in my house. So those days have been long gone. And I see parents, like, sometimes, like, even with my sister or, or family members that have little ones, I'm like, I'm willing to hold and watch the babies. But I'm just at that stage in life where if it's just, if it's a last, last resort, I'll change their diaper. But I'm like the, like the, I mean the last resort. Like call my name last. Like I'm just beyond the diaper days, right? But kids are a bit messy. Uh, they take up our time. They, how many of you know today kids seem, to, seem very expensive? Um, but without our kids, I don't believe I would be the person I am today without my kids in my life. Without my biological children in my life, I don't think I'd be the person I am without some of the youth group kids that we've done ministry with throughout my life, right? We, we, want, we aren't the same because when we're around kids, God just tends to teach us a little bit more and more about the fruit of the Spirit when we're around kids, doesn't he? Right? And so I would say that to everybody in here, um, even if you are one of those that fall into this camp of, you know what, I, I just don't think there's a spouse for me, or I don't think that kids are for me, or I don't think we're going to end up having kids. Could we say it like this? I think the Bible instructs us as well that each of us need to be around kids. In some way, shape, or form, some, we need to be looking for kids we can pour our life and our wisdom and our time into. It could be a niece. It could be a nephew. They don't have to be your own biological kids. It could be a neighbor's child. It could be somebody you work with, extended family members, someone in your neighborhood. But the most important thing we can do as believers is pour our lives, give our lives to our kids, and really make sure that they know the truth about Jesus, which leads us to the second point this morning. Church, we need to prepare our children for eternity. We need to prepare our children for eternity. We need to talk to them about what heaven is like, how heaven is real. We need to make sure they have hearts and minds that are prepared for eternity. Parents, uncles, aunts, grandparents, that's the most important thing we could do. We have the awesome privilege of showing our kids Jesus with our choices, with our actions, with our attitudes, with our words. And sometimes those things, when they line up with God's perfect plan, we look really good as parents, don't we? But sometimes when we blow it, the first ones to notice tend to be our kids, right? When we say one thing and then do another thing, our kids recognize this. Proverbs 14, and, and I would say, man, if you're a husband, insert your name. If you're a mom, insert your name. If you're a grandparent, insert your name, right? If you're a single, insert your name. But the Bible says this, Proverbs 14, 1, a wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands her own hands that stands would you underline that it says we can tear down our spiritual house we can tear down our family we can tear down our homes but it says with our own hands would you underline that would you circle that in your bible today with my own hands i can build up this family or with my own hands i can brick by brick begin to tear it down there's a clear implication here that like teaching our kids about the things of God, it requires our attention. Teaching our kids to have a godly heritage, it requires our attention. The picture I would paint is like, think of if we were building a house and just placing bricks down to create a foundation. How would we create a foundation spiritually in our home, right? I think we could take a brick and call it patience, and we could lay that in the foundation. And we could take a brick and call it kindness, and we could lay that in the foundation. We could lay a brick called self-control, lay it in the foundation. Love, take a brick and lay it. But in the same way, we can build our own house upon the things of God, the foundation of God, right? And I would say even like that, the fruit of the Spirit, love, some joy. In the same way, we can tear it down, right? If I am respectful and kind and loving to my wife, not only in front of our children, but also when it's just the two of us, right? I'm laying down a brick and building my house. When she honors me, loves me, right, in front of our kids and in private, we're laying down the foundation of what our home spiritually is going to look at. When I'm gentle and patient with my kids, I'm laying down another brick. <laughs> but in the same way, just as I build my house 
upon the things of God, I can tear it down really quickly. Do we know that? We could take a brick called complaining and plant that in the foundation of our home. We can take a brick and, and call it gossip and plant that in the foundation of our home. We can take a brick and call it just a little bit of negativity, a little comment. I could use words, just little words that would set my kids off if, if they know I'm frustrated at mom for something, right? With my words, I could tear down my spouse in front of them, right? I could, I could bulldoze an entire wall in a moment with a few words, can I? And I think we all are capable of this, but the Bible says if you're wise, you build your own home. And I hear that word wisdom, and I always think of Solomon. Does anybody like that? You think of Solomon, and then when you actually read about Solomon and some of the stuff that he was doing, you're like, was this the, like <laughs> a little bit of wisdom, a little bit not? But how many of us, I hear the word wisdom, and sometimes I feel like it's this unattainable, unachievable goal that's like mythological it's out there somewhere but it's not for me and yet when we read god's word the bible says that wisdom is for all of those who seek it the bible says that if you know jesus as your savior you can come to the father you can ask and he will give it right and so in a manner we don't need to think of being wise or wisdom as this far out thing we we can't attain or achieve but wisdom is a person and relationship that we get to know and we get to know Jesus and we get into his word and we get to allow him to shape and mold our hearts wisdom of the Lord and from the Lord begins to come out of us second Timothy chapter 1 verse 5 it's a reminder in this passage Paul's writing a, a letter to his young we could call him apprentice this young pastor named Timothy and he's also talking about family and he's talking about what we are intentional about passing on and he talks about just the family dynamics of timothy's rich heritage his mother his grandmother let's read this paul says hey timothy i remember your genuine faith for you share the faith first filled your grandmother lois and your mother eunice and i know that same faith continues strong in you isn't that amazing it's the same faith that was in your grandmother lois it's the same faith that was in your mother eunice and that faith is in you i would ask you like if you are a family that has multi-generations of following jesus that faith is in us today paul's ap applauding this rich heritage of faith Timothy was such a great man. He was such a great leader. But Paul is accrediting some of his faith to those that came before him. And here's what I want you to think about. Would you write this down? Anybody got a pen, paper, notes? Do you have thumbs, smartphones? Here's a question for us today. Would you write this down? What are you passing along? What are you passing along? What are you handing down? To your family what are you passing along to those kids that may not be biological family what are you passing on to the young people in your life I think this isn't the job solely for mothers and fathers or grandmothers and grandfathers but it's a job for everyone that we really have it on our hearts I mean, that's why we believe in camp so much, right? That we prepare the young people around us for eternity. And what can we do as we prepare young kids? Because I'll be honest, does anybody here worked with kids long enough that it's just really easier if you do it yourself? <laughs> Guilty laughs over here. Sometimes it is. Like, that's what I find. Like, the tricky part sometimes with working with young people is sometimes it's just like that, that you got to like zip your lips like that, those words like, I'll do it myself right because sometimes it is just so difficult for them to get it but here's one where we can start to pour into young people to pour into our kids here's a couple things that we can do and we're going to continue on with this next week as we talk about discipline as we talk about honoring as we talk about just what are godly ways to discipline our kids because the bible also says this if you don't discipline little little johnny or little annie right the bible says if you don't discipline your kids you actually hate them 
So we're going to talk about that a little bit next week. But here's something we can do for our kids. Number three, would you write this down? We can offer them acceptance. We can offer young people around us an ear to listen to. We can offer them acceptance. Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. Anybody who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. Jesus is saying welcoming children is the way that we honor the Lord. How many of you sometimes it's easy to accept our own kiddos, right, when they're the ones kind of like that need correction or need a little extra time or we need a little bit of patience. But it's even more difficult. I noticed like we were at camp, and, and I think the ages of this camp were 12 to 7. And, and I don't know if we had 30 boys or 25 boys, but let me just say like this, boys at those ages are squirrely, <laughs> right? And we live in a time, like anybody here remember Pastor O.T.? Now, we live in a time where like time has changed, and o- O.T. used to keep us in line with one thing and one thing alone, no teasing. But he had this towel that he would spin. And if you didn't listen, he would get you moving. He'd get you out of bed. He'd get you going. Now, I don't know that that goes in our world today, right? But some of these kids needed, they needed the spirit of OT on their lives, and they just needed a towel swap, right? Some of these boys, I was like, man, somebody go get me a towel. I'm kidding. But how many of you know, (laughs) right? It's important to, O.T., I will say this about O.T., he accepted all the kids that when I was a younger man, sometimes kids would just bug me, and O.T., anytime a kid was a little different, and those of you that know O.T., you would agree with this, anytime a kid didn't fit in socially, anytime a kid was getting maybe made fun of a little unfairly, anytime kids were just maybe a little awkward, because sometimes we're all a little awkward. O.T. would have this heart that those were the kids he would specifically target. He'd pull them in, and he'd cover them, and he'd bring them in. He'd accept their personalities, their weirdness, their temperament, right? Where I just kind of was like the knock-it-off guy. But reality is we need to accept the kids in our life because it can be a struggle. Um, I've ne- never met a mom or dad that has said, my kids are really simple. I've never met a mom say, oh, my kids, it doesn't require me to do much to take care of my kids at all. Right? I've never heard a mother say that, right? Kids have a lot of needs. Right? They have a lot, they have a lot of needs. Kids, I would say, depending on the age, by definition, kids are needy. Depending on how low we go on their ages, right? But God wants us to respond with compassion to our kids. Psalm 103, would you turn your Bible? A couple verses as we continue. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we were all formed. This is just a reminder that if we think about the compassion and the patience and the acceptance that God has offered us as we have grown through the years, right? I would say it like this. We need to be just as patient, just as compassionate, just as accepting of all of the kids in our lives as much as God has accepted us. Somebody say amen, right? As much as he has accepted us, he doesn't turn us away. He doesn't, ex- he doesn't act um, exhausted by my quirks. He doesn't get exhausted by my pouting. Does anybody hear a powder? I think sometimes, I, I think the older I get, I'm a little bit of a powder. This is my wife's chance to say amen to that, right? But God, he always has time for us. He doesn't think of us like a burden, and I think that's one of the ways we can accept children is loving them the way God loves us. Being patient with them the way, like think about how much patience God has had to show us, right? And when we model that to our kids, when we love them, man, they are going to see God's love through us. When we model God's love to them, they're going to see God's love through us. Last one, not only can we offer children acceptance, the final thing this morning um, is we can offer them our guidance. We can offer them our, our roadmaps. 
How many of you remember the day when like maps used to be in the glove box of your car? Right? Right? It's like that, those were fun, those were fun times. I remember being 18 years old in college, driving around downtown LA, and I had this map just trying to figure out where the Hollywood sign was. I found it after about four hours, right? Driving all, or I used a whole tank of gas in one day. But man, we can offer kids a spiritual roadmap. We can offer kids guidance. Consistent and godly guidance is crucial to our kids' growth, to those around us, their maturity. Psalm 78, 4. Can we read a couple more verses today? You still with me? Danette, would you come and would you play us out this morning? We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders. Parents, grandparents, and you don't even need to be a parent, but if you have kids in your life, one thing that is very clear in our culture today, everyone around them, in their schools, in the workplace, everyone around them will give them an opinion about who God is, so you better make sure you give them your opinion. Right? Everybody in their life will tell them Something the polar opposite, like, and they and, and culture is not afraid to speak out and talk about and represent things that aren't biblical, amen. So, for every bit that, like, we just kind of think we can just throw our kids a tablet and a phone and they'll be fine, no, 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 they're getting educated through that phone, right? They're getting educated through that tablet when you aren't the one speaking God's word over their life. The guidance we offer, direct your children on the right path when they are older. I love that scripture. They will not depart from it. Church, I believe there's young people in our lives all over this community and maybe in our church, in our city, that are just waiting for people to lead them, to guide them, to take action, right? They say, teach, tell. And Jesus said this, for let the children come unto me and listen. And I think sometimes if I could just be critical of myself and also, and I think my dad would agree with this as well, is I think some of our generations have done a really good job living for Christ. Like really, right? But I think it's fair to say sometimes like just living out our faith isn't enough. Right? And yes, we hope that kids catch our actions. I straighten chairs in here sometimes and I just hope, I'm like, I hope somebody's watching me straight chairs so they'll straighten them too one day, right? My staff laughs because they know I'm funny about that. But it's, it's one thing to hope people catch what we're doing, but it's a whole other thing to make sure that we're speaking about it, that we're encouraging, right? That we're encouraging our kids. I wrote this down for myself and I just put a bullet point and would you maybe write down some names that the Holy Spirit is showing you? That could be kids, grandkids, kids that aren't even related to you. But I wrote this down for me. I need to find the time, and I need to speak more intentionally to Peyton, Harper, and Quinn. Those are my daughters. And I just was thinking this as I was preparing this sermon. Yes, we took our kids to camp, and yes, we have prayer, all these different things. But more and more, the fruit of the Spirit needs to be on display in my life. And that was, would you write down some names that you could just insert names, but, uh, right, I need to find the time to speak intentionally to dot, dot, dot. Right? I need to find the time to speak intentionally. Because how many of you know, sometimes we have conversations that take place over 20 minutes where nothing was really said. We're good at having those surface conversations, but I would encourage you with every conversation, look for that 30 seconds or 40 seconds of awkwardness just to make someone think, just to make someone feel loved, just to make someone awkwardly feel seen, right? Take a few minutes out of every kind of like surfacey conversation to, to make someone feel the love of Jesus. That's what being intentional to me looks like. Would you write that down? I need to be more intentional with so-and-so. Chances are the Holy Spirit already put a group of names, group of young people on your mind. I believe like we have, every generation has to get better at this. Church, if this was difficult, and, and really I would say 
if this was an area that Joshua failed in, we should be on high alert that, man, any of us at any moment can fail in this task. I think if Joshua, like, if Joshua couldn't get this right, wow, what a battle we are facing And so as we become more intimately related and acquainted and knowing what God wants to do in our lives, I think when we do that, we begin to seek out and help children become more intimately acquainted with who He is. Which church, I think that needs to be our highest priority, helping people get intimately acquainted acquainted with the Heavenly Father. Amen? Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank You for this time. Lord, even in a church mode, we thank you for the missions and the kids that Mark Wyatt is ministering to in Africa that wear their Cornerstone shirts and all the ministry that's going on there. God, thank you for all the ministry that we got to partner with you, the King of Kings, and we got to go up to the mountains with 50 kids and we got to share the love of Christ with those kids. Thank you for bringing us home safely. Yes, the bus was hot, but we made it and you kept us safe. God, we pray for our junior hires and our high schoolers as they leave this week. Protect them through the desert. Tuesday, God, you have a radical time planned for them. You have an eye-opening, intimate connection that is coming with our kids this week. And so, God, we lift up our youth to you today. Thank you so much for blessing us with children in our lives. I don't know about you, God, I wouldn't want to go to church if there weren't kid voices here. God, you've entrusted these gifts to us, these blessings to us. And so may we take this responsibility so serious and recognize that it might not be easy, but it's just so important to pass on our faith, to be intentional about our faith. Help us look for the children in our life to offer them acceptance. To look, God, help us look for the, <coughs> the children in our life to offer guidance. And most importantly, to prepare them for eternity. Because all children matter. God, our generations of kids, you said they matter. Your actions showed us that they matter. The words of Jesus when he corrected the disciples, you showed us that they matter. So God, let us see the things that you see and help us speak into the lives of our kids. Give us creative ways to minister to them. Give us creative new ways to connect with them this old truth of Jesus. Help us to be more intentional about passing our faith to the next generation. And as we close, I just want to ask you, maybe you're here today and you're kind of like, I'm not even sure where I'm at with my faith, so I'm not sure what there is to pass along. And I just want to ask you today, if you've never considered Jesus, I would like you to just, I would just like to ask you if you want to consider him now. The Bible simply says things like this, that if you acknowledge Jesus in front of man, that Jesus in eternity will acknowledge you in front of his heavenly Father. The Bible says that he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of the Father, preparing, making a place for you, making an appeal for you. Jesus is appealing for you today to be in relationship with him. And so I want to ask you, if you've never been in relationship with Jesus, would you consider that? And would you consider acknowledging him? One of the ways that I say we simply acknowledge Jesus is... We just lift our eyes sometimes. You can pray right there. You don't even need to, right? If you acknowledge Him in your heart. But one of the ways I say we acknowledge Him in front of man, we just just lift our hand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. If you want to lift your eyes in my direction or if you want to lift your hand, every head bowed, every eye closed, if you want to lift your hand or lift your eyes and just say, you know what, I want to acknowledge Jesus today. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life that nobody comes to the Father except through Him. And God, we want to build our life based on that truth. So if you want to know Jesus today, or maybe you've been out of relationship, maybe you've walked away from Jesus just because of church things. I don't know the reason, but I want to give you a chance. If you want to get acquainted, not even acquainted, if you want to get in relationship with Jesus, would you lift your eyes or lift your hands my way? I'm just going to count to three and go ahead and do it. If you want to know him, if you want to acknowledge him in this house, can you acknowledge him now? Ready? One, two, and three. Is anybody here? I see you in the back there. I see you. I see those in the back there. I see you over there. God, we acknowledge you. I see you over there. God, we acknowledge you in this place. Jesus, come into our lives. Reign and rule and lead and change. 
God, we're broken over who we've been. But Holy Spirit, Jesus, we ask you to make us new. In your name we pray. Can all God's people say amen? Uh, can we do it one more time? Can all God's people say amen? Amen. Well, God bless you, Cornerstone.